Welcome to this Goyle Crime Cymru Festival event, and welcome to Aberystwyth. Croeso'r digwyddiad Goyle Crime Cymru Festival hwn a chroeso i Aberystwyth. Aberystwyth, the cultural capital of Wales, home to Aberystwyth University and the National Library of Wales, once home to Welsh princes. The Beeritz of Wales is the jewel in the crown of Cardigan Bay's stunning coastline and home to hugely successful TV drama Hinterland. And now, the streets that have become familiar to fictional D.I. Matthias's many fans are getting ready to welcome celebrities from the worlds of crime fiction and crime drama. Because Aberystwyth is home to Wales' first ever international crime fiction event, Goyle Crime Cymru Festival. During the early May bank holiday weekend of 2022, ABBA, as the town is affectionately known, will play host to a multitude of events that will offer something for every fan of crime fiction and drama. Internationally successful authors will entertain and meet readers in historic buildings. Pub quizzes will bring together authors and readers. Writing workshops, meet the agent sessions and informal readings will help encourage and develop new writing talent. And in sparkling celebration of new Welsh talent, a champagne reception for Crime Cymru's first crime novel competition winners. This will be an Aberbank holiday weekend like no other. So, come for the crime fiction and take Cymru home in your hearts. Rydym yn edrych ymlaen yn fawr iawn at eich croesawu i Aberystwyth ac i geredigion. Good evening. On behalf of Crime Cymru and our festival partners, Aberystwyth Town Council, welcome to the fifth event of Goyle Crime Cymru Festival Online. I'm Amy Williams and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. As you've just heard, we're featuring an independent Welsh bookshop at each panel. The bookshop for our event tonight is Gwisgo Bookworm in Aberaeron. So if you're inspired to read any of the books you hear about this evening, please do consider buying from them. At the end of the session, for your convenience, you'll be taken to the programme page of our website, where is a click-through link to Gwisco Bookworm. This evening, I'm joined by two wonderful authors. Firstly, we have Annette Purdy Pugh. Annette grew up in Flintshire and graduated in English from Lancaster University. In a varied career, she has worked as a medical librarian, an optical assistant and a milkwoman, bottling and delivering milk for almost 20 years to customers in Ceredigion. A writer from childhood, she has won awards for her short stories and poetry at the National Eisteddfod of Wales, but was inspired to take up her pen more regularly following an open university course in creative writing. A Murder at Rosings is her first novel and has its roots in a lifelong love of Jane Austen. Welcome, Annette. Thank you. Hello. And then we have Lindsay Ashford. Raised in Wolverhampton, Lindsay was the first woman to graduate from Queen's College, Cambridge in its 550 year history. She gained a degree in criminology and was employed as a reporter for the BBC before becoming a freelance journalist, writing for a number of national magazines and newspapers. Lindsay began her career as a novelist with a contemporary crime series featuring forensic psychologist, Megan Rees. She then moved into the historical genre with the mysterious death of Miss Jane Austen and with her most recent books, The Colour of Secrets, The Woman on the Orient Express, Whisper of Moth, Moon Moth, Snow Gypsy and The House at Mermaid's Cove, which blend real life events with fiction and are set in the first half of the 20th century. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you. Hello. Thank you both so much for, for chatting to me tonight. I'm really excited. I'm a, a huge Jane Austen fan. And I've had many a heated discussion with friends about the best one. 
Uh, and so that'll be one of my questions later on. But I suppose my first question for tonight is why Jane Austen? Um, and was it intimidating taking on something that's so kind of canonical? Should we start with you, Lindsay? Well, I suppose why Jane Austen? Um, I was lucky enough to live for several years um, in a wing of the former home of Jane Austen's brother. Um, it was just the most amazing piece of luck. Um, my husband was given the job of chief executive of the charity that's now based in what's actually a Jacobean mansion and country estate. And it's just a few yards up the road from the cottage in, in Hampshire where Jane Austen spent the last years of her life. Um, and so living there, I was completely surrounded by everything Austen. I would wander through rooms where she would have danced and eaten and, and sometimes spent the night in the house. Um, and as well as that, there's a fantastic library there um, of early English women's writing. And apart from everything else, there's masses of stuff about the family, letters, you know, everything that a researcher could really wish for in writing about Austin. Um, but while I was there, um, it was a sort of combination of my background as a crime writer and something that I discovered while I was there that inspired me to write The Mysterious Death of Miss Jane Austen. And that was because I was reading a letter one day in the library where Jane described the symptoms of her unexplained um, illness that caused her death. Mm -hmm. And she said that her face was black and white and every wrong colour. And as someone that's done quite a lot of forensic research for my novels, I suddenly thought arsenic, it just leapt out at me. Um, and then I kind of like filed it away in my brain and forgot all about it until a few months later we had a visitor from New York and this woman said to me, have you seen the lock of Jane Austen's hair at the cottage down the road? And I said, well, I have, yeah. And she said, well, uh, I'll tell you about that. She said it was donated by an American philanthropist and um, he bought it at auction back in the 1940s and before he donated it, he had it tested for arsenic. And so I said, really? <laughs> and I said, and? And she said, and, and yes, um, he told me, she was a personal friend of hers, that it tested positive for arsenic. And of course, this, this chap is long dead, but this lady knew him. And, and, and so I had this kind of light bulb moment and I thought, wow, I think there's a novel in there. So that was, that was how it, it all came about. How incredible. I mean, it, it that, that, that story in itself could be, you know, could be a novel. How how incredible to 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 walk the same spaces that she would have done, you know, so many so many years ago. Wow, incredible! And and what about you, you Annette? Did you find it at all intimidating? Um, not really. No, um, it was a bit of an echo on my sound. Um, I've I've been a Jane Austen fan since I was given copies of Pride and Prejudice in Mansfield Park by a family friend when I was about 12. I thought they were the most romantic thing ever. Um, I also very much enjoyed the BBC adaptation of Pride and Prejudice with Colin Firth et al. And um, I just, I had a time to myself one day, a couple of years ago, and I decided to have an indulgent day re-watching the BBC series in entirety. And, um, it suddenly struck me at the end, it would be fun to use some of these characters to write a novel, to include them in a novel of my own or a story of my own. And um, I'm a fan of crime fiction as well. And I thought that here I've got a ready-made villain in a way, or, or a, a sort of victim in the form of the obnoxious Mr. Collins. And also um, a ready-made crime suspect in the form of Mr. Bennett obviously because of the entail upon his estate. So I decided, oh, it, it was fun to do. I just set out to write it really. So I didn't sort of start to think about it being intimidating. Um, but I did decide at the very beginning not to include sort of characters like Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy and the like, the major characters, because they are icons. I think everyone has their own idea of how they are and it would be better to develop the characters of some of the lesser, well, lesser characters, less important people in Pride and Prejudice. Um, so I chose Anne de and Mary Bennett as the principal ones. I had to have Lady Catherine because um, 
she is the body is discovered in her gardens and um, obviously Mr Bennett is my suspect so possibly the most intimidating thing was trying to make Mr Bennett's dialogue authentic you know he obviously I mean I can't match Jane Austen but he had to be vaguely a little bit sort of witty if I could make him that way um, and Lady Catherine obviously wasn't I, I stuck to rather a cantankerous old person as she is um, I did sort of, she, she does soften a little bit towards, maybe towards the end of my novel. She has her sort of better point <laughs> put forward. But um, it wasn't particularly intimidating, no. And I suppose, so an, another one of the questions that I have is, is, you know, how did you, you know, what kind of decision making process do you have when it came to deciding to do a, a take on, on Jane Austen, but, but also in, in, in crime? Um, because obviously that's that's very different from from, from yes. the Jane Austen novels, and, I, that's and right. you know, I, I, I mean, you said Annette that you you were a fan of of, of crime fiction, mm -hmm. and what about you, Lindsay? Were you a, a fan of crime fiction, or was it that you know the the discovering of the locket and and the symptoms that that drew you to writing crime? Well, as I say, I, you know, I've been writing crime, and in fact, my intention when I moved down to, to Hampshire was to carry on writing contemporary crime novels. So really deciding to write the, the Jane Austen novel changed the course of my writing career. So I, I kind of made the transition into historical. Um, so, but, you know, I'd always been fascinated by crime. Um, I did a criminology degree at university. Um, and, you know, I, I always sort of had it in the back of my mind, I suppose, that one day I would like to try and write a, a crime novel. Um, and um, people like Patricia Cornwell and Ruth Rendell were absolute icons as far as I was concerned. I even had a, a, a sort of photo of Ruth Rendell pinned to my desk at one point. I used to look at her every day before I started writing. So yeah, crime was, was definitely my first love. But I like to say that I've given it up now. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you never know you never know maybe you'll you'll be inspired one day and 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 take the leap back to crime yeah, maybe. so uh, i think an important question when it comes to asking uh, authors about writing crime in particular is whether or not you're a planner or a pantser and the, there are there are two very distinct groups and and everybody seems a little bit different so are you when it comes to writing your stories, are you meticulous in your planning or do you just write and, and, and see where it goes? I'd love to hear more about your writing process. Do you have a, a writing space? Do you have a, a writing routine? Um, do you have a writing beverage? Uh, if, should we start with you, Lindsay? Oh, right, okay. Well, I'll say I started off being a pantser <laughs> and I turned into a planner and then I kind of, became a bit less of a planner. Uh, the first novel I wrote, I just kind of had a first few pages. Um, and um, I, I, I actually went on a, a writing course at the Arvon Foundation. I don't know whether anyone's heard of that. Uh, they had run residential courses in various locations in the UK. And I showed it to the people who were tutoring and, and they said, well, you know, it's got potential, but you know, what's going, what happens next? And I sort of said, mm, I don't really know. <laughs> you know, I haven't really worked out. They said, well, you'd better, you know, while you're here, you'd better work it out. So I, I did, but um, I did tie myself in, in lots of knots because I really hadn't properly thought it out. So then I went quite, quite the other way and started sort of really, really planning everything. And I really bored myself rigid by doing that because it was almost like ticking things off as I went along. So I've evolved a technique over several years. Um, and I have to say that I now base everything. When I start a new novel, I always base it on a technique um, that was uh, I read about in a book called The Snowflake Method um, by the um, interestingly named Randy Ingermaster. Oh, let me just remind myself again. Randy Ingermasterson. Um, and it's a bit of a weird book, but it's very, very good. And it, it basically takes you through stages of, of planning and plotting. And the very first thing that you start with is um, you write a, a synopsis and it has to be only 25 words. And if you can't get your idea across in 25 words, you might as well forget it. Um, and that, to me, has been one of the best disciplines that I've, I've come across. Um, and, and, you know, that's basically the elevator pitch distilled to, um, you know, their absolute essence. Um, so, yeah, I, I always I've got my snowflake method and I, I start a new book. And I think, right. OK, let's go through the, the stages. 
but it still allows me kind of creative wiggle room, you know, if I come across something. It's not like, <clears throat> excuse me, so prescriptive that it's just, you know, like a straight jacket. So, um, so yeah, that's, oh, and you wanted to know where I write. Yes. I hate to admit this, but I start writing in bed <laughs> every morning. This is my routine. I get up about half past six. I go downstairs, feed the dogs, and then I race them back upstairs because they try and get in the bed before me. And so I then try and squeeze into the bed with the two dogs and my husband and my laptop balanced on a cushion. Um, and then if I'm lucky, my husband in about 10 minutes or so will get up and make me a cup of coffee. Um, and so I, I write like this for about an hour and a half, then have some breakfast. And then I go to my writing shed down the garden, which is a really, really small writing shed. It's a bit like, um, I like to think of me being a bit like Roald Dahl, you know, who used to have his hot water bottle on his knee. Um, I have been doing that, well, not the last couple of months, but during the winter, yeah, I had a hot water bottle on my knee and a blanket and a little fan heater. Um, and that's that's what it, that's how I do it. That's, that's my routine. That sounds lovely. And I, I've never come across the snowflake method. I'm going to have to look more into that because it sounds particularly useful. It certainly has been for me. And what about you, Annette? Are you well, a planner or a pantser? I'm definitely a pantser. Um, I started with the murder at Rosings. I, did, I obviously knew who the victim was going to be and the suspect, the prime suspect. And I just sat up. I knew he was going to be discovered in Lady Catherine's garden. And I just started from there. And um, I didn't really have, I, I didn't have any more idea than the investigators who had actually done it or who I had to sort of learn as long with them as they interviewed the various servants and members of the household and um, so it was not until about halfway through that I actually knew who would have done the murder so um, I let the characters lead the way really um, I never I didn't really plan anything I'm afraid though I did as time went by sort of it, it led me into little thing little clues which would lead me to the murderer at the end um, uh, there was a point where I did have to develop a, t a, a written timeline to make sure everyone was where they were supposed to be when the murder was committed, because I didn't want to, to get it out of sync. But um, otherwise, no, I just, it sort of grows organically, really, I'm afraid, um, just through the characters themselves. And do you find then that it's almost like you are discovering more and more yes. as you go along as you write. Yes, I'm learning about the, the story myself as I go along and about the characters. Mm. So I'm afraid that's, that, that's just how I do it. Um, and unlike Lindsay, I don't really have a routine for writing. I tend to write in my, when I do have spare time, I write with, I have a laptop on my knee on the sofa, um, maybe an hour or so in the morning, a couple of hours in the afternoon. Um, we do still have a farm, so. Obviously, just lately, we've been busy with lambing, so there isn't a lot of time for anything else. But um, just when I can, really. I'm, I'm not really very organised, I don't think. And I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, having done a couple of, of these events for the festival now, how, how different everybody is and, you mm. know, that different things work for, for different people. So... <clears throat> Uh, this question was uh, inspired by um, Alice, who was our Crime Cymru co-chain festival organiser, and a discussion that we had a couple of years ago about what our favourite Austin novel is. And I was wondering, do either of you have a favourite? Should we start with you, Annette? Yes, uh, I'm afraid mine is Pride and Prejudice. Um, it was the first Jane Austen novel I read. And it has everything really. It has romance. It has excitement in the form of the um, when Lydia runs away and they have to find out where she's gone, um, and humour as well in the form of that Mr. Bennet and, and Mrs. Bennet as well. That she's very over the top. The sort of different forms of humour um, and a very feisty heroine, which is why I really like it. Mm. I think Elizabeth is the best of the Jane Austen heroines. Um, she's intelligent, she's confident, clever, um, and you can tell when she marries Mr. Darcy, she's, it's going to be sort of equal partners, you know, he's not um, in that marriage, which is good. Brilliant. Uh, and so what about you, Lindsay? Favorite. Well, um, 
I've got a terrible confession to make in, in as much as um, when I first started reading Jane Austen, which was at school, I didn't really like her books at all. And I think it's because I just wasn't mature enough to kind of get them. Um, but and obviously when I went to live in uh, Chorlton in Hampshire, I thought, crikey, I'd better remedy this. So I read them all, you know, and um, I couldn't believe how much I liked them because I was older. And um, I think really my favourite is Persuasion. And I think that's because it's about a slightly older character and it's about second chances. I like that. I like that sort of whole theme, you know, of, of second chances. So, yeah, Persuasion is mine. Fantastic. I won't, I won't tell you what mine is and, and oh. how the discussion went with, with Alice and I. Actually, I will. My, my favourite is, is Mansfield Park, which seems to be a bit of a, a, an odd one for some people. I think a, a lot of people are quite surprised when I tell them that that's my favourite. Um, talking about our favourite Austins, um, have you been reading? at the moment you know what what are you reading uh, are you reading crime are you reading something different what have been your favorite books that you've read recently we'll start with you Lindsay right well the book I've read most recently um is The Third Man by Graham Greene um and uh, I mean I, I should have read it years and years ago but I didn't and um, I actually watched the film on tv and and I only watched it because um, I wanted to do some research for the book I'm writing at the moment, part of which is set in post-World War II Vienna. And I happened to be reading a review in the newspaper and it said that The Third Man was set in that very time. So I thought, right, I'll watch it. I didn't expect to like it. I thought it was absolutely amazing. And I was so impressed that I thought, right, I must read the, um, it's actually more of a novella than a, an actual full-length novel. And so I read it and it's, it's amazing. It's kind of like a, a very sort of taut thriller and brilliantly written. Um, so yeah, that, that's the, I suppose the book that I've most enjoyed reading recently. But I have to say, when I'm writing a novel, I, I don't read many novels. I tend to read a lot of nonfiction, partly for research and partly because I don't want to sort of distract myself with somebody else's writing. It's, it's quite hard to, to get into somebody else's head while you're trying to be in your own head. You know, if that makes sense. And what kind of non-fiction do you read then when you are when you are writing? Kind of depends on what, what I'm writing about. Um, the inspiration for the current novel I'm writing came from a non-fiction book written by a, a woman journalist who worked in a, a refugee camp in post-war Germany. Um, and it's, it's brilliantly written. She was a, a really good writer. And so that's the kind of thing I would read to sort of feed into the, to the research that I'm doing. Um, for a historical novel. So, Lovely. Uh, and Annette, what, what have you been reading recently? What have you been loving? I tend to, uh, to read crime fiction. We've been very lucky in Ceredigion, dur well, during the lockdown, the, the, except for the very strictest days of the lockdown, we've um, had the mobile library, which comes to the farm and he leaves me a bag of books and he knows what I like, so I get a lot of crime fiction. Um, the latest one I've been reading is by an, an author called Luca Veste. It's called The Dying Place. He's, a, he's an author who writes, sets his stories in Liverpool. And um, as I grew up in Flintshire, Liverpool was our nearest big city. Um, we went there for shopping. We went to the theatre if we went out. Um, we had relations there as well. And it's a place I got to know quite well. And he writes, uh, that, well, this, the novel I've been reading now is, um, I suppose, about a group of vigilantes who, in inverted commas, set out to clear up the streets with devastating consequences. And he has believable um, detectives, quite well-rounded, and not too much police procedure, which can be sometimes a bit tedious. It's quite fast moving and gritty and um, uncompromising, really. And I've quite enjoyed that. Fantastic. So when you're not writing your own novels and you're not reading, what is it that you both enjoy doing in your spare time? What is it that you do to relax? We'll start with you, Annette. I, I tend to do the writing to relax from the other, the other things I'm doing. But um, <laughs> I'm afraid I do at this time of year, I do quite a bit of gardening because we like to grow our own vegetables. Um, I'm not so keen on cutting the grass. Um, otherwise, before the 
the lock, the first lockdown, or you know, it seems years ago now, doesn't it? Um, I did do some taster sessions in life drawing, which is something quite a surprise to me. I hadn't done art at all since I was in school, which is many years ago. And it is surprisingly relaxing. It's something everyone should try, I think. Um, you have to concentrate quite hard because the poses don't last very long. And it's just really enjoyable and it takes you out of yourself. You're in that moment and you've got, you don't think about anything else really. So it's something I'd like to get back to, I think, when, um, when we're allowed to do it. Yeah, I, I should think that, that, you know, you have to concentrate so hard on, yes. on what you're doing that, you know, it gives you the opportunity to completely clear your mind. Absolutely. Of you're, thinking, you're just thinking about that and you, you have five minutes to do it or something. So it's really good. I think everyone should, should try it once or twice. <laughs> Lovely. And what about you, Lindsay? What do you do to relax? Well, I live right by the sea. I actually live very near to Aberystwyth. So um, my kind of favourite new toy is a paddleboard. But the trouble is I'm, I'm rubbish at it. I can't stand up on it. But what I like to do is sit on it. I use it like a kayak. And it's great because it's so light. I can carry it down to the sea on my own without anybody having to help me. Um, and so I just kind of sit on it and I paddle out. There's this artificial reef near our house. And I just like to sort of sit there and watch the seabirds. And if I'm lucky, I might see a dolphin or a seal or or something like that. So it's very relaxing and, and tranquil. And then I've, I've got these two dogs. Um, so a lot of time is spent dog walking um, and gardening, knitting. <laughs> so it makes me sound a bit, oh, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't. <laughs> knitting is great. Knitting is very therapeutic. Yeah. Um, so at the beginning of lockdown, I was so worried about everything. I couldn't write at all. And I took up knitting again after many, many years of not knitting. And it really saved my sanity because it was something I could concentrate on, but it, it wasn't, it didn't demand the same kind of mental energy as writing does. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of re-hooked on knitting because of that. I, I, I attempted to give um, cross stitch a go when lockdown first hit and I'm not very good at it. And because I'm a bit of a perfectionist, I got something wrong I would just stop uh, couldn't look at it that's it I'm done mm -hmm. I'm done um but yeah I think I initially I struggled to to read when the, when the pandemic first hit I didn't have that kind of the mental capacity um to, to concentrate on things but this the water that that paddle boarding just sounds so that's beautiful lovely. Mm. oh it sounds wonderful and I, I I miss the water I do I, I miss the sea um I'm quite far inland um, yeah. and we've been obviously we've been in lockdown we haven't been able to go so I'm looking forward now that things are opening up to spend more to more time by the sea hopefully so <clears throat> being to be talking about the pandemic uh what do you think your characters would be getting up to in lockdown we'll start with you Lindsay well I'm sure that um, Jane Austen would have observed it all with her usual acerbic wit um, and uh, found much sort of humour in it. Um, but on a kind of more serious note, she would have been very familiar with the sudden unexpected death of, of relatives, family members, because of course, death was much more present in those days. Um, in fact, I, I, while I was researching, I read that <coughs> women who were pregnant used to write death letters to their nearest and dearest because they were so afraid of dying, giving birth to a child. And in fact, um, Jane Austen's sister-in-law, who's mentioned in my book, um, she died giving birth to her 11th child. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was just horrendous. Um, so there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. but, but going back to the sort of humorous aspect, um, the cottage where Jane Austen lived in Hampshire looked directly across the road to um, an inn, which was on the kind of major coaching route through Hampshire. And I'm sure that Jane would have amused herself by watching the comings and goings. So lockdown would have been a, a bit of a, you know, an anticlimax because it might have made her creative juices dry up a little bit because there would have been nobody going in and out. Mm. So, not so good. And what about yours, Annette? What would they be getting uh, up to? <laughs> I think my characters would be coping quite well because... Um, in a way, their, their, their houses were bubbles in themselves. So there was the big house at Rosings with the, the family and the servants. So they're all together. They wouldn't have to go anywhere because things would be delivered. And same with the parsonage. Um, 
I don't in those days probably people didn't travel very far from their villages anyway so the five mile rule wouldn't have been too much of a problem um, and as Mr Collins has been murdered they wouldn't have had to go to church so they would have been saved saved from having to sit together in church so I think they probably would have managed quite well. Fantastic so now that, that things are opening back up again and we're allowed to travel a little bit more is there anywhere in Wales that you're particularly looking forward to going to now that we you know we can move around a bit more we'll start with you Annette right well obviously I'm going to say that the first thing I want to do when um, it's we're totally released is to go and see my grandchildren and actually play with them instead of having them at arm's length but um, apart from that um Last summer, we had been planning to go to um, Hayth Wynne's house in, um, tra in uh, Trasbunny, the Ruskorden. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, he was a Welsh poet who dreamed of winning the chair of the Nationalist Earth Board. But sadly, he did win in 1917, but sadly, he died in the trenches before he ever knew he'd won. So um, the chair was brought back to his farm with a black cover of black cloth on it and it's called the black chair mm -hmm. so we would we were, we were really hoping to go there but of course that those plans have gone so I'm not sure about I presume maybe we can go this year I don't know oh, fingers crossed fingers yeah. crossed and what about you Lindsay um, well in terms of places in Wales um, that I would like to go to um, I'm hoping in a couple of weeks to go to a place called Fal de Brenin which is in a sort of a a hidden valley in Pembrokeshire, the, the Gwine Valley, um, and it's sort of in the middle of nowhere, and it's sort of um, a beautiful kind of, almost like a sort of an eco-type place with little hobbit houses where you can go and just, you know, be be alone, <laughs> um, or, or not be alone if you don't want to be, and there's lots of lovely walks, and uh, it just sounds like a really lovely, tranquil sort of place. Mm. I mean, I have visited just like for the day, but I've never stayed there before. So um, I'm just hoping to spend a couple of nights there later on this month, next month it is actually. So yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. That sounds really lovely. I've, I've never heard of that place, but it sounds wonderful. I'll have, to, mm. I'll have to look it up and hopefully get to go sometime soon. Um, this is my favorite question. In, in every author interview that I've ever done, I've always asked this question. <clears throat> And it is my desert island books oh. question. So let's just imagine that you are stranded on a desert island and you can only take three books with you. What are they? We'll start with you, Lindsay. Right, okay. Well, my first one would have to be Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte because it was the first book I was ever kind of made to read at school that I actually enjoyed. Um, and I guess that um, I was a, a bit of a gothic girl at that age, not that goths had come in at that point, but, um, you know, I didn't get Jane Austen at all, but I completely got Emily Bronte. Um, and so it just kind of switched me on, really, to literature, I suppose. Um, and I'll always be, you know, grateful and hold it in high esteem for that reason. Um, my second book would be Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier just because I just love it, you know, and it's, I just find it fascinating, you know, the sort of um, the dichotomy between, you know, Rebecca and the second Mrs. The Winter and the, them almost being like two aspects of the same woman, possibly, you know, the sort of the dark side and the sort of, the, the sort of light side, if you like. Um, and I, I just think she's a, a wonderful writer. And I think it's a shame that she's sort of been written off as a sort of romance writer because there's so much like dark psychological stuff going on there and um, you know there's, there's far more to her than that. Um, now my third book it, it's not a work of fiction um, and it's probably something that nobody's ever heard of and I'll hold it up. Um, can you see that? Can you see what that is? Oh. Harrow for Writers mm. by Corrine Kenner. Now, I'm not into tarot, you know, for telling people's fortunes or anything like that. I'm not into anything of that nature. But I find tarot cards extremely inspirational in a, a kind of creative, unlocking way. And before I came across this book, I'd been using them. 
because basically the, the uh, tarot cards are archetypes, you know, like the fool, the magician, the hermit. And if you kind of look at them, read about them, they can feed into um, character development if you're uh, you know, trying to sort of start a new novel. And also if you do a spread and you look at the way things are laid out, it can help you with sort of structure. Um, so <clears throat> when I saw this book, I thought, wow, I've got to get that. And it's really good. And, you know, you obviously have a pack of tarot cards along with it. So if you were stuck on a desert <laughs> island, you'd have endless fun coming up with plots for new novels with the help of this book and the cards. So, yeah. Sounds brilliant. Thank you, Lindsay. What about you, Annette? What will your three books be? Right. Well, predictably, one of them is going to be Pride and Prejudice for reasons I've already mentioned. And the second one, this is a coincidence, it's actually Rebecca as well. <laughs> we, did, we, didn't, we, didn't, uh, we didn't agree on this in advance, but um, I, I read Rebecca first when I was a teenager and I read it several times. And it was a book I always wished I'd written myself. I, I, I remember thinking it at, at the time, if only I'd had that idea. And um, it's such a brilliant sort of concept that um, the title character of the novel is, is not in it at all. She's already dead. But, and the narrator doesn't have a name at all. So it's never given a name during the whole course of the novel, though it's supposedly a very pretty one, but uh, we, don't, we never learn what it is. So I just thought it was really brilliant. And it was, it's, it's a bit sinister and spooky, as Lindsay said. Um, the, the, the awful um, Mrs. Danvers is a, is a very sinister person. And um, I just thought, I think it's really, I've always enjoyed it. Um, and the third book is going to be The Lord of the Rings. Um, I've always, uh, I've, I've, I've loved this for quite for a long time. And it's a book um, I actually read aloud to the children when they were small. And given that it's, it's about this wide, about a thousand pages, uh, it did take us several months, but we really enjoyed it. And um, it's a really good story, brilliant story, adventure story, heroic actions, lots of subplots and different characters. And um, I thought it would occupy quite a lot of time on the desert island. And once I'd finished, if you look at the back of the, well, the one we've got, it's got appendices with family trees of the kings of Middle Earth and lots of descriptions. And you can learn the sort of basics of Elvish as well. So I thought it would it could keep me going for quite a long time. And a thousand pages, it would absolutely yes. keep it, you it, occupied. It does keep you, time. yes. <laughs> I, Rebecca is also mm. one of my favourite books. Mm. I'm curious to know whether you both have seen the, the more recent no, adaptation I, with I Lily haven't. Jones. No, I haven't. No. Uh, have, have you seen it, Lindsay? Yes, but I don't think it's a patch on the original, oh. I'm afraid. You, you, <laughs> didn't, you didn't enjoy it? Not as much as the um, original. No. Not as good as Alfred Hitchcock? Yeah, oh. No, I don't think so. Oh, perhaps I won't, perhaps I won't rush to see maybe, it. Maybe <laughs> don't waste your time then, Annette. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of it? Have you seen it? I have seen it. I quite in, I quite enjoyed, you enjoyed it. it. Okay, well I, I see did it. enjoy it. Again, I agree that it, it it wasn't quite as good as as the original. Um I think I've completely mm. blanking on her name. The the lady that played Mrs. Danvers. Oh, I um, I did read oh, it. Yes, yeah. I can't remember. She mm. was far too um, well made up, wasn't she? Um, <laughs> she was she was so stern. I loved how stern she was. Um she looked too far too glamorous. I thought uh, she did. Yeah. But, so so I, yeah, I mean, it was it was an okay adaptation, um, but it it doesn't have a patch on the book. The book, I I I, yeah. I can't even remember how many times I read the book. Mm. It must be into the. So I'm I'm glad that that's something that you both chosen to take to <laughs> the desert island with you. <laughs> so. <clears throat> What I'm going to do now is that we um, we've been I've been fed questions while we've been chatting. Um, I have lots of lovely questions. Um, so we'll start with this one. And this is a question from Margaret. Um, and I'm guessing that this one is for the both of you. 
And she's asking, is there something compelling about bringing someone as prim and proper as Jane Austen into the realm of depravity? Should we start with you, Lindsay? Well, she wasn't prim and proper, um, certainly not from the research I've done. Um, she was, you know, maybe how people think she was. Um, but um, at the beginning of, of my book, um, I, I have a, a sort of letter from a, one of her nephews to the main character of my, my book, which is her best friend, Anne Sharp, asking Anne Sharp to contribute to a memoir, uh, saying, although I know that my aunt had a completely uneventful life, and she like bridles at this and says, how can you say that? You know, how can you say that her life was completely uneventful? And um, of course, the whole of my book is about, you know, how it, uh, how it was not at all uneventful and about all the amazing and very fascinating things that, that went on. So I, I didn't have any problem at all because I never thought she was like that in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Annette? No, well, I think um, she wasn't particularly prim and proper, even in the novels she wrote, because if you think of um, Sense and Sensibility, there's Mr. Willoughby, who's quite a sort of villainous character and has seduced a young woman. She's actually had a child. So, um, you know, the, there is the depravity in there. And um, obviously, Mr. Wickham is, is um, not particularly um, <laughs> bright and shining, is he? Um, so no, I don't think she. I, I don't think she was bright, um, prim and proper at all. So I think she, maybe prim and proper against mm, today's standards. Potentially. Yes, well, yes. Um, yeah, we are does, living in a very different time, aren't yes, we? Yes, I suppose she does. Um, she she does nothing as explicit, is it? In, in Jane Austen, it's all sort of understood, but. Um, but I mean, she certainly had her moments. You know, mm. she could have she could have married if she she'd wanted to, but she chose not to. Mm. Um, and uh, I, you know, the, the more research I've done, the more I thought she probably looked around at her uh, relatives and saw them dying in droves <laughs> of childbirth and thought, well, actually, I think I'd rather be single. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, if if being a spinster means you're prim and proper, well, yeah. I don't think she was so just just because she was a spinster um, and, and you know didn't get pregnant out of wedlock or anything like that <laughs> doesn't necessarily make you prim and proper. Mm. Brilliant. So another question that we have is from Avid Eva and they're asking uh, do you think it's important for the perpetrator to always be brought to justice in your novels? Should we start with you Annette? I'm, I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but uh, <laughs> possibly, possibly not. Um, it just depends what happens. Well, well, it depends. I suppose it depends what you mean by justice. That's all I can say. Um, I don't want to give the, word, the, the end of my novel away. So um, if, um, if I'm reading a novel, um, well, no, probably not. Not in not in the official sense of being in the court and being sentenced, but possibly it's good for something to happen to them or to, you know, to they, they get their comeuppance in some way or other. Mm. But maybe not official, not actually sent down, for example, as a definite thing. Um, I don't. There was a discussion last night, wasn't there, about. Um, whether the the um, the sort of criminal person or the perpetrator should be the hero of the novel, rather like Dexter on the on the television, you know. Um, but um, I, I'm not too sure about that. Um, Lindsay, well, I I would sort of very much agree with what Annette said, and and likewise can't really say much about my Austen novel because that could constitute a spoiler. <laughs> but I think that. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be justice in the conventional sense, you know, um, which I suppose at the time my novel is set would have meant the hangman's noose. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to feel that that, that that has been satisfied somehow, in some mm -hmm. way, um, that they haven't got away with it scot-free. Um, but I do like the idea of sort of um, leaving some things to the reader's imagination and, and letting people make their own minds up about things mm -hmm. throughout my novel you never are quite sure whether the main character is absolutely sort of um incredibly uh, i don't know uh, forensically aware and, and and clever or whether she's actually got too vivid an imagination 
there's always that slight, you know, um, worry that maybe she's just, you know, not quite normal. <laughs> that sounds bad, but, but you know, I quite like the idea that I'm playing with this idea of, you know, people kind of could just write her off as a sort of a batty woman who, who's been sort of, um, disappointed in love or something. Uh, so I quite like the idea of, of, read, of leaving some things to the reader's imagination. Brilliant. So we have a question from Wendy who asks, so Jane, Orwell, Jane, Jane, novels, Jane Austen's <laughs> novels are quite slow paced. Modern crime readers expect a faster pace. How did you get the pace right in your own books? Should we start with Lindsay? Well, um, I tried to be faithful to the, the period. It's quite a tricky thing to pull off because I was writing it in first person, um, as I said, in the character of this, this friend who really existed, Jane Austen. So I had to really kind of um, mirror the pace of Austen's novels to an extent. Obviously, it was very different because it was you know, a mystery. Um, but it was really also a family secrets novel and a kind of a, a quite an unusual love story all sort of uh, you know uh, wound into this mystery story um, and I hope that it was reasonably fast-paced but there's no way you could compare it to a contemporary crime novel mm -hmm. and I just hope that people who were interested in Jane Austen and were fans would like take it you know in the spirit of, of, of the time and I hope that they would think that I'd got an authentic sort of tone to the whole thing that would sort of be in keeping with Jane Austen's own own novels. So um, yeah, that was that was my approach to it really. And Anna? Yes. Um, let's think. Um, I think my novel is fairly not very fast paced. Obviously, I think I tried to stick as close in a way to be a sort of to reflect Jane Austen's style as far as I could. Um, though obviously more, I think probably more happens as um, as the novel as you go through the novel. It's not as fast paced as a modern, as, well, the modern inverted commas crime novel would be. Um, I think um, yes, I can't, I can't think really. Well, uh, I I don't. Um, it's it's uh, hard to give an answer to that one. Mm. Can, can I answer it because um, <laughs> yes, you've read it. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. In my, in my, wearing my other hat as the chair of Hono Welsh Women's Press, um, I actually came across Annette's submission um, and thought it was brilliant, and I ended up editing it. So I do know <laughs> something about the book. And what really drew me into it was, first of all, it starts with a, the discovery of a dead body, which is absolutely perfect for any crime novel. Mm -hmm. The other thing was that I thought she got such a, a sort of a brilliant kind of authentic voice. You know, she really had, um, you know, got into the sort of spirit of Jane Austen's writing. And, um, and as I said before, that's a really tricky thing to pull off. So not only did it draw you in straight away, and it's like a good old fashioned murder mystery, it's also incredibly faithful to you know Jane Austen's characters and, and her style of writing. So I think that it succeeds you know on, on both those sort of footings really. And if that doesn't inspire everybody watching to go out and get your books, I don't know what will. <laughs> so we have another question from Margaret, who asks: With Jane Austen and crime, is it inevitable that it becomes a cosy mystery? Should we start with you, Annette? Well, mine is definitely a cosy mystery. Um, I suppose it doesn't have to be inevitable. Um, I wonder whether you, I, don't, I wonder about something like Death Comes to Pemberley by P.D. James. Would that be called a cosy? I don't know if that would be called cosy exactly. Um, it's, yeah, it's hard to say, isn't it, really? Um, I think. I think it's more probably more likely to be a cosy mystery than than not. Or you're going to getting into the realms of sort of um, you know going off at a tangent, sort of um, Pride and Prejudice and zombies or something like that. It's uh, mm -hmm. I think if you're going to stick at all close to the um, original sort of idiom of the thing, then it probably has to be, in my opinion. 
What do you think, Lindsay? Well, um, I was going to mention um, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies as being about the only <laughs> example I could think of of somebody sort of experimenting with the genre mm -hmm. in a way that wasn't cosy. But, um, there is a whole industry in America mm -hmm. of cosy Jane Austen crime novels. It's just, you know, massive over there. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, in, in general, it sort of lends itself to the sort of cosy crime genre mm -hmm. very well. I, I completely agree. I think it's so fitting. Uh, we have a question now from Alice. And, and she says that, you know, we've talked about miscasting potentially in the new uh, Rebecca adaptation. And she'd like to know, who would you cast as your protagonists in your books? Should we start with you, Lindsay? Well, I actually um, was, was very thrilled when my book was adapted for Radio 4. Um, and uh, it, it almost made it onto TV, but didn't in the end. I won't go into the, the sort of gory details. But um, there were two actresses cast as my two main characters. And I I now see them on TV quite regularly. So um, uh, Anne Sharp, who's a friend of Jane Austen, was played by Ruth Gemmell, who is currently playing the mother in Bridgerton. Um, if anyone has seen that. Yes. Uh, and so, so that she was Anne Sharp. And the other um, person who played Jane, I terribly you know my brain, I, her name was Elaine, I can't remember the surname, but I saw her on a trailer a couple of days ago um, for a, a drama called The Intruder. Um, and I think it's, it's either on Channel 5 or ITV, and she plays one of the main characters in that. Um, so I, I kind of have in my mind these two women who are already there, who I'm sure would be brilliant. Sure that they're both a little bit too old <laughs> to uh, to be convincing, but um, but anyway, but they uh, you know they, they were fantastic in their radio um, you know roles as, as my two characters, and it was just so fantastic to kind of watch that being you know recorded, and I was there, and I was sort of t helping tweak the script, and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. So there we are. Is it like seeing your characters come to life then? It really is. It's just incredible to hear something that you've written being voiced by like, real actors. Mm. Uh, it's, it's hard to describe, but it was, it was a magical experience. Mm. It sounds it. It completely sounds it. And what about you, Annette? Who would you cast as your protagonist? I, I can't really think of anyone <laughs> offhand. I'm not being very... Um... I sort of up to date with uh, actors and actresses, but uh, what I can say is that um, my two investigators are um, Sir John Bright, who's a magistrate, and Robert Archer, the constable. I did when I was writing them. I did have actual actors' voices in my head for sort of speaking their lines, and um, I I'm afraid I, I can't remember either of their names. Yeah, I can remember one's na name, but the, not the other one. Um, the character of Sir John Bright, I always I always heard in my head with the voice of, I think, is he Robert Hardy? He's the person who played Siegfried in All Creatures, the first run of All Creatures, Great and Small. I heard him voicing these words of the magistrate. And um, Robert Archer, who is the constable, um, <laughs> I hear him in the voice of, um, I don't know if you listen to the Archers, of William Grundy from the Archers. So if you don't listen to it, it won't mean anything at all. But for people who do, I just, he's rather, rather naive, um, sort of rather a bit of a plodder. Um, and um, it just, I heard him with that voice. That's all I can say. So. Question from Matt Johnson, who would like to know, how have you injected Jane Austen style humour into your books? And do you think that's an easy thing to do in a crime novel? Should we start with you, Lindsay? Um, well, I just kind of mined everything that I could find that Jane Austen had ever written. And, um, you know, I, I, I took things that she'd said and wove them into like, not, not sort of in a plagiaristic kind of way, but um, for example, um, I read, I can't even remember where it was that I read it, um, was that uh, people's intelligence was judged by the size of their noses. It was kind of like a, an Austin family joke, that the bigger your nose was, the more intelligent that you were. Um, and there's a comment partway through the book that um, Anne Sharp, the, the main character, is, is judged by Jane Austen's mother to be highly intelligent because she has such a, 
a fine, large mm -hmm. nose, and Anne doesn't quite know how to take this. She thinks perhaps she should take it as a compliment. Whereas Elizabeth, the sister-in-law, has no nose at all, you know. Um, and uh, so it's things like that I sort of took and, and adapted. Um, but there is so much there, you know, if you obviously read read everything that, that you know, mm -hmm. you can take things from, from her own sort of wit, because she was a very, obviously, very witty writer, um, and weave them in, you know. So that's what I tried to do. What about you, Annette? Right, um, I did try with Mr. Bennett to um, to inject a little bit of humour into things that he said. Um, for example, when Mary, this is this is early on in the book, um, Mer, they're discussing Mary's view, the possibility of her ever marrying, and um, it has been suggested that she might meet one of her uncle Gardiner's clerks and and marry, go find someone to marry there. But um, she said, obviously, she says, oh, she disparages that. It's not something she thinks is, is suitable for her. But um, Mr. Bennett says that the, the world needs clerks just as much as soldiers, you know, and probably ra rather more than it needs grand gentlemen. So um, I put sort of remarks like that in there. Um, and the, I don't know if it's Jane Austen style humour, but... Um, the, uh, the the constable, who I say is rather is, is rather sort of um, naive and um, unworldly, does visualise Lady Catherine in sort of different positions, <laughs> different um, situations sometimes during the course of the novel. Um, when when the, when the the uh, magistrate says that he's going to interview the family, you, you know, you're, oh, you're not going to interview Lady Catherine. He visualises Lady Catherine in the dock at the county assizes. He has an awful vision of it in his head. So um, I put a few things like that in, but um, obviously not up to Jane Austen's standard. Brilliant. And uh, another great question. What do you think Jane Austen would, would make of your books? Should we start with you, Annette? Oh, gosh. Gosh, I've no idea. Um, she'd probably, I don't know. Well, I, I think she might be quite surprised that so many people are writing Jane Austen spin-offs. Um, when I started this one, I really, I, I mean, I'd, I'd read Death Comes to Pemberley and Longbourn, which is the story of the um, uh, Joe Baker, isn't it? Um, and the, I think Val McDermott had done, had done a Northanger Abbey, hasn't she? But um, I, I don't know, I, I had no idea quite how many there were around, so um, I think she would really be quite surprised, but I don't know what she'd, I don't really know what she'd make of it, but um, hopefully she might find it amusing, but though I think she did, she didn't really like um, sort of crime type, well, I don't know if that was a crime genre in those days, but um, I think she said she wanted things with happy endings that were, you know, didn't deal with uh, too unpleasant subjects. So possibly she might not have liked those aspects of it. Now, what, what about you? I don't know. I don't know what she would have made of it, really, because I'm basically kind of raking through the family secrets. Um, and mm. I don't know whether she would have liked that very much. Um, I know that after she died, her sister Cassandra burnt a great many of the letters that, that had been written between them which suggests that there was something that they didn't want the world to know about. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that they were very keen, you know, not to sort of um, wash their dirty linen in public in any way. And, and of course, my novel suggests something quite, you know, controversial, um, mm -hmm. not just about the, what was the cause of death, but also about the relationship between the two women, um, mm -hmm. the nature of the friendship, so I don't know, but I hope that she would have appreciated the, the kind of uh, depth into which I'd sort of gone into everything about the family. Um, and th at the end of the day, um, it's about, you know, strong women. Um, and I, I hope that she would have appreciated that. Mm. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, hope, I hope she wouldn't have been too horrified <laughs> by it. It's to uh, the last question, actually, which is, what is the most interesting thing you found out about Jane Austen or her world when you were doing your research? Lindsay? 
Well, I suppose I've already sort of to some extent gone into that in as much as it was the um, the business of the arsenic. Um, <laughs> and I, I, that led me to do a lot of research about the use of arsenic at that time. Um, and I, I discovered that um, although we can, we can never be sort of categorical about what she died of, um, I, I certainly ruled out some of the things that had been mooted as a possible cause of death by just simply investigating. Uh, and one thing I, I discovered was that she, she did suffer from, for example, rheumatism. She names that in her letters. And she would have been given a medicine, um, probably, that contains arsenic. There, were, there was one particular one around at the time called Fowler's Solution. And there was an absolute epidemic of arsenic poisoning um, in the 1800s. Um, some of it was accidental. Some of it was deliberate. But it mimicked, arsenic poisoning mimicked the symptoms of various other things and you could get away with it. And it wasn't until 19 years after Austin's death when um, a test called the Marsh test was developed that you could actually say categorically that um, a body contained arsenic or indeed hair, which is this, this where my story you know, focuses. Mm -hmm. um, you could tell whether there was arsenic in it. But up until that time, there was no way of proving if somebody had, had died of arsenic poisoning. Mm -hmm. Finding all that out was probably the most interesting thing as far as I'm concerned. And what about you, Annette? Did you do a great deal of research? When I, I, didn't, did I, didn't, I didn't, I'm afraid, apart from rereading Pride and Prejudice a couple of times. Um, what was the most um, interesting thing that you learned, you know, rereading Pride and Prejudice? Oh, um, I suppose just the um just the sort of uh, well how how um accurate how well it's hard to say really um just how well constructed the novels were really um but um i don't i don't, I don't know really it's it just um nothing i suppose that i i had nothing more than i'd i'd learned i'd always known about them but um, I don't know if I learned anything new about them, really. As, re as to research, um, I did have to look up things as I went along to make sure I, I hadn't got details incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, sort of when, when did, when, when did um, schools begin for children? I realised I was going to talk about a servant who was young, so young she should have been sitting in school and of course she wouldn't have been as a girl in those days mm. and um, did jigsaws exist in Georgian England I, I remember checking that so I did um, I did check things as I went along but um, as regards research not I didn't really do very much and and did jigsaws exist in those times I did, yes <laughs> <laughs> brilliant and, you know, we've, we've come to the end of, of the audience questions. So thank you both very much. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us this evening. And thank you for your brilliant questions. Just to remind you that if you'd like to buy any of the fabulous books that, you know, that have been discussed this evening, please consider clicking through from the programme page to the featured bookshop, which for this event is Gwisco Bookworm in Aberaeron. And finally, on behalf of Goyle Crime Cymru Festival Online, I'd like to thank Lindsay and Annette and to wish you all a good night and we hope to see you in Aberystwyth next year. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.